to our last session of talks for the kickoff of the Center for Music on Chicago. Thank you. Um, oh, there's handouts. Does everybody have one? So, I guess that's sort of the title I sort of offered to speak on was um, the Our Chronicle is Discernible. What I had in mind was to talk a bit about. Um, so, as a result, what I mean by chronicles is articles of um, any symmetry type in respect to the fermentation group. Um, so, I think that's pretty much what um, Gordon has in mind. Of. Um, my chronicles come from the idea that on the one hand we have this one really quite, we have bosons and fermions which are the quanter and on the other sort of the, the other extreme of these different kinds of uh, chronicle types we have Maxwell Boltzmann quantum systems which should correspond to something like chronicles at least statistically. So this is a word that sort of interpolates uh, between them. So I was going to talk a bit about I mean, in general, about some results to do with the discernibility of particles. Um, and uh, in particular, to reflect on some new work done recently by Simon Saunders in the first place and Fred Muller and Simon Saunders in the second place on weak discernibility. I thought I had some fairly easy criticisms to make of you know, what they did, but as I worked on it, what sort of turned out, I think there's sort of more, more that I want to say about them, and I mean, more actually really in agreement with what they say fundamentally, but I think there's some problems with the way they went about it. But laying that stuff out drew about some of the things I was going to, much of what I was going to say about particles. That sort of exists in various places um, anyway, so it's maybe not such a great loss to humanity that it's turned out that way. So I will talk a little bit about um, those issues about particles. Um, but really, I guess what I'm going to talk about is trying to make this in, um, insight that Muller and Saunders had actually do the work they wanted to do. Okay, a little background first. One nice thing that Simon did in this um, literature is go back to a paper from by Quine in the 70s, um, Grades of Discriminability, and point out that I mean, the issue here is to do with the identity of indiscernibles, whether it's violated or not by, by fermions, by bosons, by other kinds of particle. And what he pointed out was that the, the debate you know, really had to, I mean, obviously, if you're going to pose that question, you have to say something about what is going to count as the properties you're willing to appeal to to um, discern, thing, discern things, but also, you need to give some thought to the different ways in which things are discernible. And this isn't quite um, Quine's terminology, but it's the one that's in the literature now. We can think of sort of three grades of discernibility. So the first kind of discernibility is sort of the most obvious one, where you just have a property of one thing has it and the other thing doesn't. So they're discernible, they're strongly discernible. If that's the case, then if you're allowed to still propose relations and the sort of normal logical operations from primitives, then it's going to follow that the systems are also relatively discernible. There's some uh, third thing, which the first one bears a relation to, but the second one doesn't. Um, but the implication doesn't go the other way. And finally, if they're relatively discernible, they're going to be weakly discernible. There's going to be some relation that um, each bears to the other, but neither bears to itself. And you know, in Quine's work, these are kind of interesting because a weak discerner, if you have a relation that's sort of totally symmetric on your domain and complete and, and irreflexive, then that's sort of the weakest um, uh, condition in which you can define a, a, a relation that satisfies the axioms of identity. So this seems like a sense in which you've got things that are discernible. Okay, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the first two kinds of discernibility. And really, the work I had on particles was just um, saying that the most general thing, certainly I could think of, and perhaps the most general thing you can say about strong and relative discernibility um, of particles. 
But now I'm going to talk about their account of um, weak discernment. So the formal framework here, we're imagining we have a system of identical particles. They have all the same uh, intrinsic properties. They all live in, each one has associated with it the same single particle uh, Hilbert space. One, you've got n of them, so we look at the, the n fold tensor product of, of single particle Hilbert spaces. And well, let me start off by I mean, since the weak discernibility is actually going to focus on quanta, uh, and, and most of what I'm going to say is I'll, I'll say a little bit about generalizing it. Um, what we need to focus attention on are h plus and h minus, which are respectively the symmetric and anti-symmetric sectors of the space. So, I'm sure everybody knows, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I've got my n-fold tensor product space. I can define a state um, living in that space. I can define an exchange operator that takes the state, any state you find in the, the subscript in IJ, say. It'll take any state you find in I slot and any state you find in the J slot and swap them over. So that's an exchange operator, and H plus are the set of states for which that operation just returns the, I mean, the very same vector. H minus is the set of states for which that operation returns at minus the vector. Okay, and then the full set of permutations is obtained by just multiplying um, exchange operators together. Okay. More hopefully familiar stuff. S key is the symmetrization postulate, and we put it that way. Any system of particles, the states um, either all lie in H plus, and that's bosons, or they all lie in H minus, and that's uh, fermions. In the case where H1 is two dimensional, that then uh, spans up, both the, those two sectors span up all the space. If there's more, um, if H did it, um, if the, the dimension of the single particle Hilbert space is bigger, then we get other representations, and other sort of um, representations of the, the permutation group, and that's where the particles come in. But H plus and minus are what we're interested in. And the indistinguishability postulate, the IP, often put as saying, I mean, this is sort of written down as a commutation relation, just say for any, uh, any observable and any um, permutation, and then use pi for permutation is zero. I put it slightly differently to really underline its import, <coughs> because of course there are operators on HN that don't satisfy that relation. And the strength of the import of the IP is to say they are non observables. Okay. And the SP implies the IP. And that seems to be. Okay. You might want to say a little bit more about exactly what that means, why that, the sense in which that's true. But I think for now I'm just going to leave it as something that's the conventional wisdom on the topic. So that means that we have bosons, so the SP is satisfied, but only an H plus, the IP is satisfied, or if we're talking about fermions, the SP is satisfied, so the IP is, is, satisfied, is satisfied. Okay. Um, and, oh yeah, one more thing. So, a sort of general thing that goes wrong, this, if you take an operator, say a mission, a mission operator that doesn't satisfy this, what's kind of wrong with it is if you act on a state in one of these representations, in one of these sectors, it'll take you out of the state, out of the sector. The problem with such operators it gets more complicated when there are other representations around, but the problem with such operators, a problem with such operators, is that they don't have an eigenbasis for the sector. So I'm saying that now because this is an effect. Okay. So that's the basic formal framework. And this is what the 
sort of state of play and looks like with respect to um, strong and relative um, discernibility. So we've got our um, the HN state um, Hilbert space and a natural way of thinking about, well, I've got n particles, what's I want to know about the um, value with respect to some observable of one of them. Well, I'll say the eighth one, which one observable should I be talking about on the HN? Well, it's one that's got eyes in every slot of the tensor product, except the eighth one where you took your um, Q. Um, so Q is supposed to be um, one of the permission operators on H1, of course. Um, okay, and then this is the standard way the game of discernibility gets played. And this lead goes back at least to a paper by French and Bray Bennett uh, in the 80s, I guess. Would say something like this. We can define a property and say A possesses this property, and sub Q and T if the, you know, the QA, the um, single particle operator corresponding to A, and the actual Q on the eighth slot in some state of psi is equal to T. And then, well, if you think about these single particle operators, they form a family so that the, you can use the, these pi's of the, of the exchange operators if I want to go from the one that has i in the first, in the, so it has q in the i slot, to the one that has q in the j slot. I just conjugate it with the permutation operators, um, which by the way are permission, so it's status redundant. So there's a hair trigger on this. Um, okay, so, but if you've got the symmetrization, so now we're looking at this kind of relation here. Okay, I've gone with eight i. Okay, I want to know what is the expectation value of the i, um, the, the, the q single particle operator for the i slot. Well, I know I can permute the state on both sides because either I'm talking about quanta, so either I'm going to get two pluses out or two minuses out. Either way, I've got this first equals. I'm just going to pull the permutations, uh, the exchanges um, into the operator space here, and that just is going to give me the other single particle operator, for the, the, single, the same single particle operator for the J slots, so their expectation value is guaranteed to agree. Um, if these are the, so the sort of idea here is that the only kind of single particle, um, or, or the only kind of you know, one place predicates that we have are going to be related to operators in this way. And so we've just shown that if that's true, then if one holds the property, if we're talking about quanta, one has the property, then we will do it. And so the conclusion is that clearly the quanta are not strongly discernible. It's a little bit more complicated if you have relative discernibility, but then you're thinking instead of having sort of a sig, you're going to define a relation and you're going to say q sub a. O sub B is some other kind of property that's sort of the product of two of these single particle things. And you're just going to show, and then you're just going to show a very similar kind of result, and you're going to show that the things, the quanta aren't even relatively the same. Okay, a couple of comments. You know, this way of defining relations in terms of expectation values taking on um, particular on particular numerical values. That's the way people have decided to play. This game is not played. I guess I'm, I'm not in Saunders fit with that a little bit. They're going to look at, it, at either states rather than expectation values. Um, but basically the idea is sort of the same. To think about what quantum operators are reasonable for defining the kind of predicates you're interested in. Um, second comment, something very weird happens here which everybody has sort of gone along with. This isn't, this operator manifestly violates the IP. So, it's not an observable. Um, I'm going I'm to make sort of more comments about that, but everybody does that. I, I, I've done that as well, and um, I think one of the things I like about Muller and Saunders' insight, as I'm going to show you, is we can actually make, say, something substantive about discernibility without violating the IP. They don't kind of realize that, but that's what I think is actually nice about their insight. There's something very weird about this whole sort of discussion. I mean, of course, if, yeah. Finally, about this, the most 
general thing, so I, I put some sort of results for other symmetry types. But they kind of look the sort of, they look very similar. If you've got a pair of slots where you know, psi is equal to, I'm um, sorry, the, ex the exchange ij psi is equal to plus or minus psi, um, then that's the kind of state in which um, those two will turn out to be um, in strongly relatively indiscernible. So, in general, if you've got in fact, what I've, what I've shown is that if that, that will hold if and only if the I can J slots are not even relative to this. And that's kind of, I think, the most general thing you can say about this. Okay. Well, let's move on to a weak discernibility, which we're really wanting to, to get to. And, you know, the insight that Simon had, I remember talking to him a number of years ago in Bielefeld, the field theory conference there, he was sort of talking about, well, think about a you know, singlet state. Well, these are fermions, so they're weak and not even relatively discernible, as we've seen, but surely they are weakly discernible by the relation of has opposite spin to it. That's irreflexive. Neither of, the, neither of the electrons in either of these states has opposite spin to itself, but in each state it does have opposite spin to the other one. And I don't, I don't always kind of see why Simon's excited about things. So this was a, <laughs> Okay, but it's a very similar kind of game. 
It looks a lot like the, right, the definition we had before. Okay. Then there's a very sort of straightforward sort of uh, theorem you can prove. So C is just a constant, C the plus one, um, that's the boson case, or that'll be a, a subset of the, a subspace of um, H plus or H minus for fermions. S is the parity of, I think that's very good, uh, is the parity of the permutation, so it's either um, zero or um, <coughs> so zero for even permutations and one for odd permutations. I'm counting numbers of products of the, I should say exchanges, even odd numbers of exchanges. So it's just a general way of writing down all Fermi states are like this or sums of these, and there's a subset of the boson states are like are like this. And okay. So suppose we've got states where uh, each term is different and um, in fact I think they'll look better for the normal. Okay, then the theorem just is, well, that operator that um, you know, that's that appears in the definition of the relation. Um, all, you know, any state of that form has eigenvalue is an eigenstate with eigenvalue minus two. And if the indices are different, if the indices are the same, then any state is an eigenstate with two d minus one uh, as the um, eigenvalue. These remember the dimension of, uh, of H1. There aren't any sort of zero dimensional single particle spaces here. So this is definitely not equal to, uh, to minus two. And you know, in fact, the case we're looking at, where we have the, the spins, d is equal to two, and so this is it's equal to plus two. Okay. So clearly, given the relation, and again, the hand to look back at the relation when we're looking at the theorem. If we put t equals minus two, that's a relation that holds if and only if a and b are different slots of the Hilbert space, and so that's what we need to be discerned. All Fermi states are like that, so they're always, and we can discern bosons are sometimes like this, and when they are there, we can discern. So, let me skip, I, I'm getting a little behind, so I'm going to, so I just, I just plugged in for the case where um, it's pumping the intuitions here, and, you know, we have a two-dimensional H1, and you know, I already told you sigma is a difference of projection operators, I already told you, you know, there's the minus 2 for the case where A and B are different. Here's the case, here's the plus 2 that we just said we get in the case where A is 1, 1. If we're interested in whether 1 bears this relation to instead of what 2 does. And so it all works out, it gives exactly what we want in the, the case that we sort of started thinking about. Thank you. 
say sort of up front now what, what you should sort of take away from this. Well, first of all, it would be nice as to do as they as, as they attempt to so draw these results, making the weakest sort of set of interpretational assumptions possible. That's what they want to do, and that seems kind of right to me. And seems to me allow it. Uh, Seem to allowing um, IP violating operators into this story seems to me to make this sort of, uh, an unusual and strong interpretational assumption. So we do well to sort of try to violate that. I mean, to try to maintain sort of standard assumptions. Second, something a little bit stronger. Conventional wisdom seems to be pretty right about this, that we shouldn't allow um, IP violating observable uh, operators to count as physical properties. Um, and so there's just something wrong here. Of course, as I said, it's something that everybody in this literature has, has done, so I'm not in no way singling sort of them out. But what's nice about what they say is you don't need to do it. So that's kind of the third, the third way of taking it, I guess. I'm going to show you how we can really get their intuition without using IP violating observables. Um, second, so that's the first kind of objection, that we're still talking about observables, that so not observables, mission operators that violate the IP and so aren't observables. Um, second issue is one they bring up, which is this is going to happen for any any n any number of particles, but you can see it easily in the case where there's two particles, um, two bosons, say, and suppose you've got a unitary operator that takes the both up state to the up down plus down up state. Clearly, there are unitary operators that do that, and now define a new relation on prime. It's just like an old one, except we conjugate their observable with this unitary operator. Well, this operator here is going to have all the properties on up, up, that their operator had on up, down, plus down, up. And so I can define a relation this way. And if, that's a, if, that, if this observable is allowed, I mean, if this operator is allowed in a definition like this, then it turns out that A and B are weakly discernible. These two bosons are weakly discernible. And that seems just, that seems wrong. It certainly doesn't fit their intuition in, in a state where they're both identical particles, both up, both in the same state. You shouldn't get them discerned at all. So, yeah, someone mentioned this to me. It's in that paper. Their response is a kind of weird, strong operationalism that the system may not be allowed to undergo this unitary evolution, and so this doesn't count as an operator. But I don't, A, or what it is, we still we don't want to be observable, <laughs> discernible in that case. And B, I don't quite understand why we're forced to interpret this as something that requires it, the actual possibility of the system evolving in a certain way. Okay, so I want to say something better about what's wrong with this kind of observable, this kind of observable in the definition. A pretty for Fermions have a different problem, set of problems. Um, the operator they define does act as, I mean, right, it doesn't satisfy the IP, but it does have an eigenbasis for H minus. It doesn't ever project you out. So although it doesn't satisfy the IP, it has the same action on H minus as an observable that does satisfy the IP. So that's not a problem. Um, there. And we kind of like it that all fermions get, in any fermion state, the fermions get to the unique So that's not a problem. But here's the other problem, and this was really the first thing that I really that was kind of puzzled me the whole time about this. If you think about what their theorem says, I mean, it says for every fermionic state, right, every fermionic state is an eigenstate with a, the same eigenvalue. That means the operators they're using here are just multiples of the identity. I mean, that's part of their strategy because they've then got to prove that every, in every fermionic state we've got them weakly discerned. But it's by you know, it involves a multiple of the identity. Okay. That seems kind of weird, and it's taken me a while to sort of really cash out what's weird about it. And I, I 
think I'm going to say is the best way of, um, that I've got about doing this. Um, I must say, I had a conversation with Hillary about this, so briefly at the PSA, and she, I don't know, she said just a couple of sentences that really helped me get, I think, get clearer thinking about this. I don't know if I'm right, but I don't think I'm as confused as I was. Okay. So I want to talk about what follows from this, I mean, this is a mathematical statement, that this operator is just this operator. But of course, there's mathematics, and then there's physics, ontology, there's, there's the actual set of properties. All right, so the natural thing you might think is, you know, a natural thing to think is, um, well, when I said under A, if you've got two of, so, of, sort of, if there's just one mathematical object, it can't correspond to more than one physical property. Okay. So, whatever our property they're appealing to, if that's right, I'm going to sit and there's the other possibility. Um, whatever property they're appealing to just is the property represented by the identity. What follows in that case? Um, so here's just a sort of simple argument. Um, they're saying, okay, we're going to define this relation that holds um, in this case. That's just copying down their definition. Okay, well obviously there's two cases, A could equal B or A could not equal B, so their definition simply says the same as this, and of course these are different operators in this case, so um, either this just, you know, either um, this jump is satisfied, or this jump, this jump is satisfied, I don't done anything much there. Now I'm just going to appeal to the results of, you know, appeal to that theorem, but this operator is just um, 2d minus 1 times the identity, and this operator is just minus 2 times the identity, so just think about this as a sort of just as a logical argument to start with, okay, I can certainly make my substitutions here mathematically, um, but this is just the identity, so you know, we know it's automatic, you know, we know what 2d minus 1 times the identity acting on the psi is, it's just um, 2d minus 1, it's another leap for the second disjunct, so clearly all we're saying here is, um, sorry, this relation holds if a is equal, you know, a is the uh, same swap of the tip of the same quantum, the same fermion, and minus 2 is equal to this, but d is never equal to 0, so of course that's a contradiction. Um, the second disjunct says a and b are not the same um, fermion, and minus 2 is equal to minus 2, but that's a tautology, so all this says is a, is not a and b are not the same um, fermion. I mean, in a sense, I just to think about that logically is just to give the argument that this relation weakly discerns. But now think about this as talking about right, what it says about the properties these operators represent. Right? And this sort of crucial step is going from this is where it's sort of split the disjunction up to this one. Right? This relation holds if you know, this property holds or this property holds. But that's just to say the relation holds if this property holds and you know, this property holds. But this, right, well, what the remaining lines show is that you know, the second conjunct of the first disjunct is a contradiction. And the second um, conjunct, uh, the second disjunct is a tautology. So the only property being represented here, 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 and hence here is that of being in different swaps. There's no physics here. This relation is equivalent to just saying it's a relation. I mean, this is the property that's being picked out by that method, the property of them being in different swaps. But if you were going to let that weakly discern, then this whole talk about observables is just sort of is otios. When I'm just saying they're in different swaps, they're weakly discernible simply in virtue of that. No physical properties have been sort of brought into this. Um, and I just want to say, this argument, this, two, this is the bit that I pointed out to me. There's, I think, I remember right here. I mean, there's two ways of sort of thinking about what this if and only if says. So, to kind of use for old fashioned terminology, this could either be a sort of real definition or a nominal definition. So, a real definition. 
definition, then the holding of this relation just is somehow the, um, the possession of the system of this value for this property. And then, clearly, this relation is just the relation of A not being B. And we haven't sort of shown that they're weakly discernible by any physical properties. So that was actually how I was thinking. But it could be a sort of nominal de definition, and this is just it's not telling you what constitutes the definition, it's just telling you some necessary and sufficient conditions for this relation to hold. But the necessary and sufficient conditions just turn out to be being in different slots, and so now that doesn't give me any reason to think that this relation is a physical one. It seems, you know, if you want this sort of nominal definition to at least give you some physical necessary and sufficient conditions for it to hold, give you any faith that it was a physical Either way, we're in trouble. So, that's why I got excited when, um, actually, I guess it was in Dave's talk, when we started talking about whether the identity was observable. Or not. <coughs> um, okay, of course, you might want to say look, although there's just one mathematical object here, um, really there's many physical properties, and I'm not appealing to the identity one, I'm appealing to some other one in this argument, but then you've got to give me some story about why I should think that, and in particular why I should think that the property you're picking up is one that's relevant to defining such a relation. And the things you might appeal to might be to say, well, look, the operator I've given you is equal to the multiple of the identity on H minus, but it isn't on the whole tensor product space. But that just seems not to take the symmetrization postulate of the fact that they're fermions sort of sufficiently serious, but H minus is the space in which they live. Okay, I can sort of think of bigger spaces in which I can sort of take direct sums and make them and then make any operator I want different from any operator you know, on H minus, but why should thinking about the action of this operator on some sort of unphysical states tell me anything about what it means for the physical states? Or you might say, and this is what um, Greg and Simon do say, well look, those states we started with on H1, they're sort of physical, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the eigenstates of a physical property on H1, so they're projections of physical properties, so they're differences of physical properties. So when I take single particle, you know, I, I, I put them in tensor products with lots of eyes, I've got something physical, and then I just multiply those things. I, I, just, I don't know, I sort of put preservation of physicality through this sort of my construction here. And you know, that way of looking at things says, look, yeah, I'm really looking, say, at the spin of the sort of first particle and then the spin of the second particle. But that just seems, their result just sort of shows what's wrong with that line of thinking. You can sort of do this construction and you end up with the identity. Basically, I mean, the spectral theorem is kind of just a trumping that kind of line of thought. You just end up back with the identity. Um, well, that's one thing to say. Another thing is, that story doesn't make any sense, because again, these operators aren't, uh, I keep violating, and they don't make any sense. <coughs> okay. So I don't think, either way on this take on this, sort of responding to this consequence of what the theorem says, gets you out of trouble. Okay. Um, but then I got really worried. I was looking at this state again, and surely they are weakly discerned by their spins. So what sort of, what sort of went wrong? We did this thing to kind of capture the sense in which they're weakly discerned. And um, it didn't work. We ended up with stuff that doesn't, you know, for all the reasons I've now mentioned, um, didn't work. Um, so let's carry on just thinking about the Fermion case is problem that it's multiple of the identity at the moment. But it occurred to me just trying to start to think about what sort of physical situations I'm actually thinking about here when I'm saying that it's a part of the thing we can discern by their spins. And it occurred to me, well, you know, the sort of standard, um, well, I don't know after this, I'm thinking about, say, a bell bone type experiment, and then I'm like, well, they're not just spin states, they also have position states. So let's just sort of put those in. I mean, that seems an actual way to sort of see the state to be thinking about here. So let's put it in position. And I'm just going to make it a two-dimensional position space for left and right. Um, okay. So 
So, and I should say, Fran and Simon do talk about the infinite dimensional case, so it's not like they're just, I'm, not, I'm certainly not saying they forgot that things would spin in that position or anything like that. Um, it's just something about the way they've spoken, how to think about the insight, that made me kind of forget that. Okay, so then, let's take that as well, and let that single particle Hilbert space now have a spatial bit and a spin bit. Two, uh, we'll have two particles, so, um, right, so now that the single particle space is four dimensional, the two particle space is 16 dimensional, H minus, you know, the symmetric, anti-symmetric sector um, is six dimensional, the bosonic sector is 10 dimensional, that's everything. Um, there's now two cases to sort of think about when we're interested in the sort of up-down, down-up state. One where L, L and R really stand for the left, pack it on the left wing and pack it on the right wing. And another one where maybe you're thinking about an atomic state. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Um, where L maybe is sort of an S orbital. You've got two atoms in the lowest sort of energy state and they've got two electrons and they have opposite spins, so they satisfy the um, exclusion principle. And I guess in this case, R is going to stand for sort of P orbital. So, so, very quickly what's um, going on is, so suppose we're just going to demand that we've got a pair of fermions, and so in, one of them's definitely on the left, we're going to say that there's definitely an electron on the left and definitely an electron on the right. The fermionic state, the sector of H minus that corresponds to that is, is four dimensional, it's spanned by states like this, where they both are. Um, uh, up, down, um, right, so uh, the one on the left is up and the one on the right is down, and they're both down. And there's a sort of natural, you know, it's an easy isomorphism to uh, a four-dimensional uh, you know, Hilbert space, which corresponds to these spin states. And basically what we're doing is mapping um, the left particle in the, big, in the big space, down to the first slot of the second of the smaller space, and the right particle down to the uh, second slot of the smaller space. Okay, and then, so a relation like this, a state like this, is what we then go and represent when we're thinking about so entanglement, we just look at the spin part. But of course, it's, the spin on the left is entangled with the spin on the right, and if you wrote out the whole state, you put in the, the position part of the state as well, and you'd say the state was like this. But now there's something kind of funny about, you shouldn't sort of now think, and then there's a correspondence between operators as well. So this is just explaining why we kind of project down for a completely ignore position. Um, but, uh, this is obviously not a good way to think about, a good case to be thinking about. Well, it's true that one and two, left and right, are did weakly discern by spin, but it's also true they're strongly discerned by their positions. So the whole kind of came in over here, because one corresponds to the left packet, and two to the right packet, they're really strongly discerned. So it's kind of a funny case to be um, thinking about. More promisingly is the case where they have the same spin position, so it's like the same position, and opposite spins. So when they're both in the S orbital, um, and now they're weakly discerned, they're not discerned at all by, in any way by position, but they are discerned, weakly discerned by, as opposite spin. So that's kind of the case to think about. But even in that case, you know, really the lesson of what's going on up here, I mean, um, really the lesson of what's going on is, you look at up here, you look at these kinds of states, it's not always the case that the particles are weakly discerned by their spins. Here they have the same spin, but they are weakly discerned by their by, by the relation of is not is in the, is in a different position to. Here they're weakly discerned by their spins, but you can imagine an energy comes along and now one of them gets excited. The point I'm making out here is, of course, we should look at if we're thinking if we're taking you know we 
kind of use spin to weakly discern and use that as a model for the sort of general case. Um, I want to take one pick an operator that just isn't, we don't need to use an operator that's the identity on the whole space that's available. And I can use, there'll be some cases where spin weakly discerns. But now suppose they're both spin up, but one's in the P orbit and one's in the S orbit. Now spin won't weakly discern, but um, position will. And so we're just going to use a different operator to do the discerning. You can take advantage of the biggest of the size of this Hilbert space to come up with like, operators that aren't multiples of the identity. Um, okay, so let me just put that into operation. First of all, so I've kind of pointed at how we're going to get around this identity problem. How are we going to get around the IEP problem? Well, forget about the IEP, here's the single particle, sort of standard form of a single particle um, or an operator corresponding to a single particle property. Well, the natural thing to do when we impose the symmetrization postulate of the IP is just to symmetrize it. So that's a normalization, and then we just sum over permutations. And then we can think about defining a property that holds um, with respect to single particles of you know, a permission operator on H1A and real value T for small particles such as slot A, if and only if the state is an eigenstate of that symmetrized operator um, with that eigenvalue. According to this definition, of course, um, I am I'm thinking nominally here. This is a related, this property is going to hold of all the part all the um, all part of all the quanta if it holds of any of them. But that's okay. I mean that's the kind of thing we expect to happen. They're indistinguishable quanta. So that's the sort of form for defining properties. That's just doing the same thing, same idea with um, relations. And in particular, to actually get the weak discernibility going, I'm going to define sort of, we can say, uh, sort of a product operator that's going to hold between A and B, and only if A and B are the same, and then we have A squared, um, so a bunch of I's, an operator which size an eigenstate with an eigenstate with an eigenvalue t, or it's just a different normalization. We have two a's, um, size an eigenstate with an eigenvalue t. So basically, we're sort of doing the same thing they did, right? They had psi squareds and then psi times psi. It's the same kind of basic um, thing, except I symmetrize. Um, otherwise, it's very similar to what they've done. And then, for instance, if I take spin, this operator will it hold um, sort of if and only if. Um, well that, I've just written out the operator. Uh, sorry, I've just written out um, the operator explicitly for the spin case. And it does just what we want. In the case, the full bell bone case, we do get them weakly discerned by um, spin. And not just the left one and the right one number one here and number two here. So uh, weakly discerned by spin. In this case, they're weakly discerned by spin. And I mean, by the, the relation has opposite spin to. While, as we expect in this case, um, their spins don't weakly discern them. Having opposite spins who doesn't weakly discern them, though, of course, has opposite position to does weakly discern them. And, OK, this is a very last slide, so I'm really wrapping up now. I thought that was a little fast at the end. I hope you got the idea of what I was suggesting. So we have operators that, partly what the last show was slightly showing was, these operators aren't multiples of the identity. They, as I, as I symmetrize, so they do satisfy the IP. Um, well, as long as I pick um, A squared is not equal to I, it's not equal to I either. Neither operator is going to be a multiple of the identity. And unfortunately, in the spin case, one of those observables is going to be a multiple of the identity there. But I don't have to make that choice. And then there's, these are the general results that sort of follow. As long as I have basically the same state 
that same kind of state that Muller and Saunders were interested in, then I am going to be able to find a relation that weakly discerns them. And that leaves just one problem when we have the say up up state. Basically, what I managed to show so far, maybe that's not, is if I have a tensor product where every state, if every slot has the same single particle state in it, like up up, it's one of those, then I'm not going to be able to find an a relation that we can discern so that has the pattern I do. So I've also now told you what's wrong with, effectively, what's wrong with the observable that we can discern in the Muller Saunders case. I think they're right about the spins, I just think the way they just chose to represent it doesn't make good sense. This is the way we should do it. Okay, and I same operator, different properties idea that you were projecting. Um, I think the intuition behind um, taking a property to be um, being in an eigenstate of, um, of, 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 of some observable is something like you do an experiment and the property that the, the, the corresponding is definitely getting this result. Something like that. And um, the identity, of course, um, you know, can, can be decomposed as a sum of orthogonal projections in, in, in different ways. Um, but um, you could think of uh, it this way. Um, an experiment, you know, if you're, you're going to specify what experiment um, I'm going to do, it, um, rather than saying I'm going to do an experiment corresponding to this Hermitian operator, an experiment or at least a von Neumann measurement is a set of projections and you know, po possible rights, or you, you can even generalize it to POVMs if you want. And I think implicitly in what Fred and Simon are doing is they, so they start with a certain eigen, a certain normal basis. They've got these projections and they construct this R thing out of those projections. I think implicitly what they're imagining is the, the, the corresponding property is do an experiment corresponding to those projections and you're guaranteed to get results, blah, blah, blah. And then if I start with a different set of projections, um, I will, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, if I, if, I, if I start with a different set of projections, I've got a different property, even if um, for fermions, then, you know, so, you know, so as I start with a, a, a certain set of projections and, I, and I'm going to do a certain experiment, and David starts with a different set of projections and he's going to do a different experiment. However, for fermions, every state is, it, it, the, the thing I've constructed out of you know, my projections um, every state is guaranteed to have a, a, an eigenvalue plus two. Fermion state is going to have an eigenstate plus two. And so with David's projections, but nevertheless, being eigenstate plus plus two for those two different um, things or different properties. Does that, does that make any sense? Um, so let me say a few things. Um, so first of all, Right, so I have a sort of general, I mean, it's sort of just a general question about whether we can think of the identity as corresponding to, you know, different properties corresponding to its sort of different decompositions. I mean, to that general question, I still find that sort of hard to sort of really think of that as a physical property since we don't have it to do any measurements at all to know the well, Okay, here, quick, look, 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 okay. So, I mean, there's a simple, I want to, let me just set things up a little bit. Right. So, but even so, I'm not sure it sort of helps in, in their case because it's not quite as if that operate, the operator they're giving is, I mean, the way that, so I mean, the way they write it down, it's not a sum over, uh, I mean, it's a sum over projection differences, so, okay, so I guess it is a sum over sort of projection break up the differences. 
but then there's still sort of the problem. It has to be sort of, I mean, if they want to actually give it the interpretation they do, it seems like I'm not quite sure that breaking it up into different sort of sum of projections is going to sort of preserve that. I mean, they want the measurements to be, um, I mean, the, the observables that are supposed to be doing the discernible are sort of the differences of projections. So if they've got a story, I mean, you want to have a, Right, the kind of story where you say why this is something that has to do with weak discernibility. You're sort of comparing sort of the difference of projection squared for sort of one part, single particle with the sort of product of the difference of projections on one with the product of the difference of projections on the other. So it's not quite the case that you're sort of describing. I mean, I kind of appeal to the spectral theorem, but that's, it's not quite that they're... I mean, it, there's, there's sort of some algebra to get from the, interpret, you know, the properties that they're interpreting in a certain way to the identity. So I'm kind of interested in the general question, and I, I sort of push back on that sort of somewhat maybe in the way I'm saying, in the sort of specific way they're setting things up. I sort of push back more strongly, but it doesn't seem like they can tell that kind of story and keep this sort of together as a story about weak discernibility rather than sort of some other property that doesn't correspond to a relation. Great question. I see, I can't think of a manner of if I'm swayed or not by your argument against um, the identity that the one that just shows that you get, you get either A, B, A, B. I, I guess his worry, I mean, sure, um, that relation is extensionally equivalent to the, to the non identity relation. But of course, I mean, I take it just to be entailed by the discernibility hypothesis that it insists that if, um, if the entity in a system of ET, Discernible, then uh, the relation I'm going to be using to the discernibility in a given case is at least going to be a subrelation of the identity um, relation. So, so it's, it's the thing that I all, for this to actually have teeth, I bet I, in many of the cases I've got lots of these relations, all of which are subrelations of it, um, and then and between them I can get back the whole thing, but it's not okay to have one relation that does the whole thing in one go. Sort of 
counts as a physical relation between things and quantum mechanics. Right, so my reasoning, I'm kind of just repeating myself, so I don't know if I'm actually addressing what you want to do. My reasoning is also focused on this side. They say this is a physical relation because this is a physical observable. And I'm saying, if we take observables and properties to be sort of one to one, it's not a physical property. This observable doesn't correspond to a physical property because it just corresponds to them being in different slots. Oh, okay, so try this with an analogy. Suppose I've got a classical theory um, and I've got a lot of, it contains a lot of qualitatively identical spheres which are not interpenetrable and which are layered a centimeter in the radius or something. And I consider the relation uh, A is um, A is at least two cent the center of A is at least two centimeters from the center of B. Uh, now that relation is irreflexive. Um, I take it that that relation su suffices to weakly discern the um, all, all of the spheres in one point of sense. But it's also the case that I'm just going to establish inside like that system that um, that two, that, um, two, that, that, that R does fall between two objects, even only if they're um, uh, they're distinct objects. In other words, I'd be able to run that kind of argument. But that doesn't seem to undermine the claim. No, no, right. right. So, right. So again, there's sort of two things. I mean, if you take one way, if you just sort of look at it as a piece of logic. It just sort of is an argument that this weekly disturbance right? of everything. It allows me to, I mean, it just shows that I can sort of define non identity yeah. in this way. But again, I'm saying don't just take it as a piece of, I mean, these are property identities in here. These aren't just sort of logical maneuvers. I'm given a property of an observable here, and that's picking out a, a property of the system. The same as this property so, yeah, by my as kind of by the sort of by the assumption that one operator means one property, it's this property, but that's property is this property. So what I'm saying is that if, since we can make this um, this move here, this isn't just sort of a piece of logic, the property that they've actually given here, which is supposed to be um, defining this relation. Is nothing more than a non identity. And I'm trying to, to see why, in my clear example, the relation of being more than two centimeters away is just likewise. Just well, the relation. I mean, is that the identity? Um, it's an identity. I don't know, is it, I mean, is it, I mean, there's sort of, think about the, I think there's two identities here. I'm thinking about the identity operator and the logical operator. Well, so the two centimeters yeah, apart doesn't the, seem. Yeah. It's going to be true on all points of place. It's yeah, the last one. I think we're the I'm not sure that I agree with that. So, I mean, I think this is just a reformulating Dave's question. Um, we, I mean, those if and only ifs right, are just telling you that the thing uh, in the line, in, in two adjacent lines, are essentially equal. So, you keep saying they're property identity. But how do you get that extra? Right, because it was saying, right, we seem to make that we have a choice, right? We have one of the theorem tells us we have one of I mean in the same index case we have one offer this operator operator, a mathematical object is this operator, in a different index case, this operator is this operator. Okay, what are we supposed to make of that? Well, one possibility is each operator just corresponds to a single property of the system. Other possibility corresponds to many. I guess it correspond to none, but that's not right? First case, operator, same operator, same property. I didn't have room for an A or a slide. But then at the back is what justifies this in step here. I mean, I'm, I'm just talking about the same property. And then I say the other steps are just trivial ones. So if you don't like the other ones, then I'm kind of interested to hear about this. But isn't that, I mean, that's mm -hmm. that, that's that's the question. Like, why, if I couldn't get down to the bottom of the slide, the operators aren't playing, right? We're, we're just doing logic and somehow, I mean, there's room to question whether two relations that are essentially equivalent like that. So you were at about five to six, say, or? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, 
So, okay, so you're happy to go from there. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I suppose my way of any point is always just going to be the, the kind of status of the leaf. I mean, of course, this is right as, as a good essential reason, as you said, yeah. the logic, but it's the... Yeah, no, no, okay, so it's the practice. Okay, good, so I'll be honest with you. Let's, if you understand the form of the argument. Yeah. Um, so this one's just sort of true by assumption. I get to make that move because each operator just corresponds to the property. So whatever property is being sort of referred to here, here is just this one. These are just refer to the same thing. So, I mean, you, you might object to my double disjunction, making a disjunction here, but then I think you should comply. Then that is, I don't think that's open to Simon and Fred because their property doesn't have a sort of explicit disjunction in there, but it says explicitly. So that's not going to help them. That's the argument by assumption. Um, what about that? Yeah, well, I guess I'm appealing to an understanding of what the identity sort of is here. And it's just sort of the trivial property of, sort of, I don't know, um, But when, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's just how I think of the identity. Yes, yeah. the identity just is the property for which you know, the, we think, think of, we it amounts to this. Yeah, yeah, when you think of this, case. and then I think I'm kind of done. Right. When you think of the identity for the two spheres, right. Right? you've got the same sort of thing. You've got this property that's extensionally equivalent to uh, non-identity. But at the beginning, you think, oh, it's a physical property, right? And if you went through an argument like this, you get down to the bottom. But some, uh, in that argument, you would want to resist. Yeah, yeah, I think it's not the identity. So the question is, it's not the identity. I mean, they could be different distances apart. The point about the fermions is they can't be an anti-symmetric state. No, it's essentially equivalent. I mean, by the fiat, it's not the same property. You know, but by the way, by the fiat, I have the example, and no particles are allowed to be, are kinematically allowed to be in the same place, and the relation is is non-zero distance apart, and that relation is going to turn out to be equivalent. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the point. You're going to say more about why essential equivalence is identity of consciousness. Can I, can I just add something? So, but again, you're thinking of, I mean, where in the because I know it's just an assumption here, so you can reject that assumption, and then we'll go down the other way and you can tell me why this defines something, and then we've got the arguments over there. But, I mean, are we agreeing? I mean, the objection to what has to come here. Because this is just an assumption of argument. I mean, if you don't like that, you just look at the other. I just have a technical question. Can you go to your last slide? Yeah. What's the restriction on the basis states alpha? Um, I'm trying to think. So I think I, I assume that they're, I mean, they're all for normal. That's all. Uh, What's bothering me is that if you don't put some kind of restriction on them, and there's no restriction on the coefficients except that they're symmetric. Uh, yes, the symmetric are just symmetric. Doesn't your weakly discernible case include your not weakly discernible case? I mean, suppose I take the product state at the bottom and just expand each one of the factors in some basis, and I use the corresponding basis for each one of the factors. The expansion that's been found for the discernment case. Yes. I don't think anyone you want to I'm take that case. But every state like this is orthogonal to every state like this. Oh, oh, no, wait. Right? Why? I mean, these are the ones where they're all in the same state. I don't see how. Yeah, this isn't, the so this, isn't a, this isn't a basis. For, for no, but it can be expanded in a basis. Bigger basis, arbitrary basis, expanded. Expanded them all in the same basis. And don't you have an instance of the discernment case? Well, I mean, So you mean, okay, so okay, so you're thinking sort of in each psi expanded in the alpha basis. Something yeah, like that. The alpha basis is, that's why I asked you what the restriction is. Right, so the alpha is a basis for H1, right? 
Yeah. Okay. And then these are states in each one. Right. Um, expand those. Yeah, you don't get a state. Unless I kind of expressed this wrong, I don't think I have. I mean, these are all states where each particle, um, there were some conditions that were, were kept the same as the ones in Fred, uh, Fred and Simon's uh, theorem. Well, I'm not familiar with that paper. Well, it's on, but I, this is, okay. so it was at the beginning of the talk. So, um, so, all right, these, so these are all the normal states. Yeah. Um, if I expand this in the, out, I mean, in fact, to show this, you do expand this sort of in the alpha basis, and then you then sort of define an operator that um, has those. You, you then pick an operator on H1 that has the outputs as eigenstates okay, so with not, different I, eigenvalues. Okay, the only thing I'm not understanding, I'm not understanding why the bottom case is not. So, included. well, here's a state like, so here's a, here's a dot on, maybe I'm just, what I wrote it down right, maybe a, right, so. So there's a boson case that's like the first one. And, but here's the other two. I mean, here's the two. So two particle, two spin cases that are like the second one. I can't expand this in terms of this. No, but you could expand both of those states in terms of x spin states. But that's not going to make it like this. It's not going to make it. So they're going to make it. <laughs> I will put this on. But it's not going to turn it into something that's a sum of states where everything's in the same state. So I'm saying if I've got I'm not saying you can bring the expansion form in the leafy discernible case down to the not discernible case. I'm saying the not discernible case is already an instance of the weakly discernible case if there's no restriction on the basis vectors output. But I can't I mean I so here's so here's my non weakly discernible case. I can't expand that in states of that form. With, with anything, I mean. No, but you could expand each one of those up factors in the not discernible case in terms of x spin. You get terms like up, up, up. Yeah, but it's not going to turn it into something of this form. You're outlying what you think it, right? Yeah. So if you expand up, up, say, in the x axis, you'll get terms like up, x, up, x. Yeah, these all have to, so these are all different. Okay. Yeah, well, it, it really, yeah. I mean, it's not. It's, it's not very hard. Um, I mean, in fact, I mean, the way I did it was by. I mean, to show this, you, you do just expand these in the sort of alpha basis and then say, suppose there was an operator that was, was it such that it was an eigenstate and had the form that I said, and then. Well, then that gives you a relation between the action of the operator of the specified form um, and the quality between that on a, on a item of t times the statement of the coefficients, and you can show that the operator you define must just be a multiple of the identity. And then the p 